Okay, what I wanted to just start with first is as we're a committee, um, we uh, are looking at our S40, our lead bill, and I'm trying to get us to help us to get a little bit more focused on where the decision points are that we as the legislature need to make. I've outlined what I can see as the primary um, questions that we need to answer. We don't have to have a discussion about that yet because we've got people in here right now. But the first one is cost. Who's going to pay and how much, it, how much is it and who's going to pay? The second is the timeline. What are we looking at in terms of when we get started and what we're, we're through? The third is the action level. What action level are we going to set? And the fourth is who is going to be included? Child care, what, how deeply do we go into child care facilities? So that's where I'm trying to see if, if we can address those decision points. If you think of other ones, we can share that later. But at the moment, what I want to focus get, us get focused on is really a better understanding of um, the, uh, the, the joint fiscal note that we got and to clarify the accuracy of, of that in terms of hearing from people from the field. So actually, probably what might help is to have some of that fiscal note up. Um, Kayla, could you get that fiscal note up so we can take a look at that? What is the computer? Or, or yeah. you know, here. She's get the Shannon's going to get for us. So we have today, so this is Lyle and Bruce, correct? Correct. Okay. So for the record, um, why don't you, could you introduce yourself so that we can sure. connect your voice with what we're going to hear? And if you have an opening statement, you're more than interested, interested to hear. Okay. I'm Bruce McIntyre, Director of Facilities for Addison Central School District. Uh, so I've, I've read through the Senate bill and definitely have an opinion. Have <laughs> Great. Uh, and, but I'd be, I'd like to just answer your questions if that's possible. Okay. And Lyle? Uh, Lyle Smith, Williston School District, also here just to answer your questions. <laughs> so I guess my first question is, um, one question that I would have for you is, who in your school would be, in your district, would be capable of making some of the, the remediation that would be required? Are there different levels of qualities of staff? Are there requirements in your communities for you know who can, who can start taking plumbing apart? Sure. Example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just for everybody's context, uh, uh, Bruce is the facilities director at Addison Central, which has gone through this process already, done the testing, and has been doing remediation. Correct. So it's real, it's real experience as opposed to potentially. Uh, so we do have a, a staff member who can change faucets, changing a faucet um, without, um, you know, moving its location or, or changing anything about it, really. Uh, it's considered maintenance, so you could have in-house staff do that. Um, you know, out, out of the roughly, you know, 26 employees that are in the facilities department in the district, uh, they're really only um, myself and one other person who has the skill to, to do that. Uh, the, I do have another maintenance worker who will do some plumbing type work, but uh, as far as it changing out a fixture or changing a water fountain, uh, it's really the two of us and uh, I would say the majority of the time I end up hiring a licensed professional to do the work. Yeah, it, it's similar in my school district. There are probably uh, one other employee and myself, and often that employee will get in over his head and have to call me. Uh, I've got a ton of other things to do, so if it's a really big project, we, we typically wait until a school break and have to plan these things out far in advance. And part of the reason we have to plan these things out far in advance is because if you go to shut a unit off and the old valve does not hold, then you've got a much bigger project than you originally started. And I think that's part of my concern with this, is some of the older schools are going to find a lot of project creep. And uh, they're going to get into a lot more than they realize trying to chase that uh, pit that they got in their test. Questions? 
So you, you've gotten all of your schools? Um, we haven't remediated all of our schools. We've tested all of our schools. So, and you've, you haven't changed faucets? or we, We're in the process of changing faucets. And have you tested any of those that you've changed? Uh, we have tested a few that we have changed. And the results? And the results were better. Were better. But, but we, we had three months after remediation that we waited to test. Because when you go and disturb something, you have to stir up the... Was the testing that was performed, what was the level of parts per billion? Uh, so it, it ranged quite quite a bit. Uh, so first draw, we, we ranged from you know, one part per billion up to 278 parts per billion. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that happened to come from a shower in a middle school locker room that they don't use. So, and that's part of the issue, is it was, hadn't been used in years. But the other faucets, if I may, the other faucets? The other faucets, uh, we, we had about a third that were above the 15 parts per billion on first draw. Thank you. Sorry, are you 10? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Please join us. We are just in the process of, of uh, asking people in the field. We're trying to get a better idea of what this bill means in the field. Um, Caleb? Um, in the remediation, I don't know how much you've done so far, but we were having a discussion the other day about just permitting that would go along with some of these changes. Sounds like a lot of the fixed replacement would be maintenance, and I'm guessing, therefore, it might not require a permit, but I'm wondering at what point you would anticipate that you would be getting building permits or fire safety permits or anything, plumbing permits, anything like that. Yeah. Plumbing permits uh, would be what's applicable, and we do that for drinking fountains. A lot of the old fountains aren't um, aren't at the right height for ADA. So if we're going to replace the fountain, we'll put it back at the correct height for ADA. That requires actually just moving the plumbing, and that requires a permit or a licensed professional to do it. Do you have a cost estimate for what that permitting obligation run? I, I believe it's uh, <coughs> just the permit itself. Is it? Permit's not the, cost the issue, it's uh, the cost of the, the unit that you're replacing it with. The unit and the professional to come in and do it. So yeah. you're probably talking about $1,000 for the, it's called an LK is what most people use, uh, bottle filling station slash drinking fountain. That gives you a filtered stainless steel drinking fountain that has a counter on there that tells you how many gallons you put to the <coughs> filter and when it's time to change the filter. Um, so by the time you spent $1,000 and probably I'm guessing $600 maybe for a plumber to come in, if there are no major issues with all the valves that are ahead of that unit. So it can be costly, but a lot of schools have started to phase out the old water fountains anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that we've all been working towards typically, uh, if you have any budget at all. Some of the smaller schools maybe not, but most high schools and middle schools, uh, bigger ones have been doing this for quite some time. So. Can you scroll that up a little bit, the iPad? Um, How far are you on it? Yeah, I want, to go up, I want to go up to where we're looking at, at the, the, the cost for, for units, that, you know, where they looked at the... That was back on the page. What's that? Go, go back one more. Go back up here. No. It was on the page we were on, wasn't it? Right there, 300 per tap. Tap remediation cost estimate. Okay, there was something else that had a number of schools. <coughs> There you go. Yes, there it is. Right there. Can everyone see that? Or you only got one more. So, so help help us help us go a little bit deeper into what this this says. So this is looking at. Uh, so they can't see. It should be it should be on the iPad. Um, maybe you could show them the iPad so they can see them turn around. There you go. It says they're looking at 400. Lyle, you have a pretty big school there. How many tabs? I'm sorry, I should have You know, I, I tried I quickly. Oh, no, it's way more than that. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I remember just counting the water fountains, and it was a ridiculous number. Oh. Because if you think of, in our school in particular, every classroom, when we walked through, had a sink. <coughs> yeah, and some of them had a sink and 
of, of bubbler. Right. Um, we have bathrooms and hallways, uh, little onesie, you know, stall bathrooms. We have bathrooms with multiples. Um, we've got the kitchen. Um, we've got hose bibs that I worry about with coaches filling up Gatorade mm -hmm. buckets. Uh, custodial closets, I think, probably don't, don't make sense to do. I mean, but we even went in the art room, and the art room teacher indicated that yes, in fact, some kids will drink from there, which was a little surprising, but I guess they do. So, well, we really put a number to the amount in a 145,000 square foot school. It's, it's huge. Uh, and when we did our renovation, which was almost $20 million worth of renovation, we opted to change all the, the fixtures and all the, the faucets but did not change all the copper in the building because it was too expensive and had to take it out of the budget, which means that we still have, you know, solder in there and those pipes. So the, the level of parts per billion worries us because even though we've changed all of our faucets and the end use, the piping getting to it is still the original. Yeah, that's, that's been a concern of mine right from the beginning. Is the supply, the source. Yeah. I'd like to add a couple things if you guys don't mind. Please do. And for the record, could you give us your name? My name is Ken from? Sullivan. And you're from? I'm from the Addison Northwest School District. <clears throat> I also am a licensed plumber, probably one of the only ones in the state that, that direct buildings, grounds, and safety. I've been doing this for about 30 years. I got a couple of concerns here, points in regards to consumption and how and causes that get us to this point where we have high lead levels, especially in children. Um, homes, I think, is probably generally where we're getting most of it. I think everybody can agree you send your kid to school with a full water bottle, not an empty one. And that very well could be a contributor to this. Um, a couple of other things that throw me a little bit in procedure with the health department in taking samples would be if we are going in there and taking a sample in the morning before anybody does anything and there's 400 faucets that we're going to sample we're going to take the first sample that's going to have lead in it we presume and then we are going to flush if i'm not mistaken we're going to do a flush sample by the time we get down the line, we have now flushed water from the main town, likely, through everything. So as we go, the lead will diminish throughout the procedure. So we're not getting, we're not really getting a good level of lead throughout. <clears throat> so just to cut through all of it, I would say the best thing to do to get a measuring stick, stick for this state would be to send a sample kit to every home and every building in the entire state. One bottle that you take on Monday morning at least six hours has been, it's been, you know, the, the pipe's been sitting for six hours. And you sample what comes out of there after everything's been sitting in every single building. That's going to give you a pretty good measuring stick of where the state sits in consumption. If you really wanted to just put it to kids, it's families that have children. You could look at housing developments that were built pre-2012 in Vermont when the lead laws came in, or in 1991 with the safe drinking water and lead and copper rules that came into place. But in the early 80s, that's when the highest lead was happening in housing developments. So we have housing developments out there that are probably really high in lead content when drink drink from the fountain. Those are a couple of things, but you're also not, I don't think we're addressing a few other things. Risks in schools, particularly, uh, could come from the pH of the water or the source, as somebody might have said. Could come from electrical grounding, because when uh, electricians go in over the years, and they ground piping, or ground electrical tube piping. It can cause the pH and electrolysis action inside corrosion to happen. I think we've all maybe heard of that. Water heaters failing because of improper grounds and those kinds of things. 
those types of things can create a higher lead level because it's basically corroding the inside of the plumbing. You also have uh, the source of the water, which most municipalities actually put orophosphates in the water, which coat the inside of the plumbing <laughs> pipes from the source to the spout. <laughs> that is, I would say, most municipalities. I'm not sure what the regulations are on private wells and those types of things. I think that's another discussion, but that's where I would stand with some of that. <clears throat> some of the other risks that you have are velocities of pipes, old plumbing, lead, <clears throat> lead solder. We're not, if we're taking a sample, like I said, in every faucet, we're not taking a sample from the, the worst, oldest plumbing in the crawl space where the lead and water, where the lead's leached into the water over the weekend. That's where we want to take a sample from. That's where the highest lead is. Because after you've done 50 fixtures, you know, you're wasting your money at the health department and their time testing for lead because it's flushed, more or less. So considering all those variables and occupancy, the w number one thing I thought about in all of this discussion is <coughs> how come we're not talking about hot water? Every single kitchen I know of fills the pot to boil the noodles with hot water. It is proven fact that hot water has higher levels of lead than any other faucet. The EPA's put it out to flush with cold water, to rinse. It's, it's right on their website. It's really easy to find that information. So we're not discussing hot water either, but we're talking about two samples on cold. When we're filling the pot to cook the noodles for the children with hot water, which I can surely guarantee is higher than the cold water. It's not as flushed as often. There's components in that system that are going to help uh, it, it, it leach the lead and contribute to the lead factor. And this is no, this isn't uh, something new. This goes dates back to um, the Clean Water Act that the federal government has put through. So I would say that there's a lot of things to think about in this other than just simply going around to taps and testing at the faucets. Yeah, to your point, I was talking to um, Tom Breiter from ATC, and he said that there are still lots of, and I was surprised, of lead pipes in municipal water systems that probably are safe because of the additives they put. The oral faucets. Yeah. Um, but they still exist in homes, in older homes, the, that connection to the main. Um, and I know wells have foot valves, and I know they've changed them from the old bronze and brass to stainless because there were lead in those. So lots of homes with wells likely have a possibility of it. So home consumption homes are probably the biggest contributor, and there is nobody in the state of Vermont really policing this. So we're talking about adding more rules to something that there's already rules in place for, but we're not policing. We have one plumbing inspector, and he cannot go around and check every faucet to ensure he didn't buy it off of Amazon and it's loaded with lead. <laughs> and it's impossible to get a hold of this without policing what we've already got in place. So we cut inspectors, we don't inspect, we allow residential um, owners to do whatever they want to, even wire their own homes. This is a contributor. And it's been from decades of allowing that and not, I'm not big on over-governmentizing it, but we need, if we want to control what's happening, we have to see it. And uh, I think there's, that's a big contributor to lead over the years. And to add to the point, there is plenty of lead in, in pipes. There's asbestos line pipes out there. Did anybody know that they're probably at home have that? And, they use oral phosphates to mitigate that and mitigate the leaching of all metals, potentially iron bacteria or asbestos piping leaching into the water or lead leaching into the water. That's a, that's a mitigation process that we already do and we are aware of. 
and most of the problems are not the source. They are the piping, an old aged piping, especially when they break. So in Montpelier, I understand there's been some water breaks. Every time you break it, it is going to disturb the oral phosphates. That is going to intensify the potential for lead in the water coming out. That is going to end up at the drinking fountain every single time as a little brown water at the school from that break. And this happens, this just happened to me yesterday, as a matter of fact, in Virgen's Panton uh, area. And I sat with the Virgen's Panton Water District this morning from 6 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. to ask them some questions and get a little knowledge of their point of view on this. And their point of view is that um, our source is good for the most part. They can't speak for wells. Our practices are good. The lead levels are below the EPA's suggested amounts in CDC. We can do better. But, it, but it's, but it's going to be strategic and more of an investment grade audit to individual buildings than it is to just paint a broad brush across every school or building in the state. Investment grade audit to each building to find out the circumstantial issues that they each have, whether it's grounding, whether it's acidic pH in their water, whether it's 1954 copper and lead plumbing, or other factors that may contribute to the lead in water. Part of our job that's going to be set up <clears throat> on how how we we set the policy, and then we can have the other smart fellows figure out that detail. We are looking at um, we're looking at action levels. We've got the EPA action level at 15 that has no correlation from what we understand to health. The uh, health folks are saying that it should be nothing. We are looking at, from you, what it's going to take. How accurate are the numbers that are before us as we figure out how we're going to test and pay for remediation? Who's responsible for paying for it? It's only the children. Most of us feel some responsibility for the children. And if we are to figure out what this is going to cost, we have to have some idea about what it's going to cost. I really do appreciate the complexity of, of the problem that you're talking about. In looking at where the problem can occur, there's sort of different levels of responsibility along the way, whether it's at the municipal level that's giving you water that, that, that's problematic, or whether it's, it's in the building and it's in the faucet, or it's in the pipe. All of those will make a difference in terms of cost and how deeply we go. Can you give us an idea, I think it was the other paper that actually talked about the individual cost for fixtures, what they figured. I think they figured, I don't know where that one is, but looked at. Like tap replacement that's highlighted for $300. Yeah, $300 a tap. Yeah. That's that really going to be blown out of the water. OK, yeah. talk that's to right. us about that. Uh, blow it out of the water. Perfect example. Yeah. Now, is that including labor? No, 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 that's a story. Yeah, yeah. We're assuming true. there's somebody on staff that can do it. Oh, 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 oh goodness. There's Not in that. Vermont. There's an assumption in this that the schools just need to get the fixtures and the school will be involved in the replacement. When it comes to the child care providers, there's an assumption that they're going to need help. The, everyone's going to need help. <laughs> <laughs> they are. I mean, technically, if you're on a municipal water system, you need a licensed plumber to take a faucet out. Yeah, that's the that's plumbing code Vermont follows, which we don't police, but it's certainly a code. You know, I'll tell you, most schools do not follow that rule. No, of course they don't. And <laughs> nobody does. They can't afford to. No one does. And so when there's a huge flood because of it or something else happens and they cross-connect a heating pipe to a water pipe and someone gets deathly ill, 
then it goes back into the insurance world and that's that's what ends up happening but we do have these laws and codes in place they're there we're just not we're not looking at them but you take a, a, a kitchen sink faucet mm -hmm. Uh, that that throw, throws and skews this entire thing from a lavatory faucet because you're talking about a $1,200 faucet. You're talking about a good day job to remove a three bay sink with all the drains, unplug it from the wall, pull it away, get to the plumbing on the back side of that, replace that valve, put it back, hook it up and have it running in a time window that most people cannot even afford in schools because this is running all the time. So there's, so there's a time window that's either done at night or weekends or vacations, which usually costs more. So now add that to the labor, and you're talking about a potential $2,000 faucet <coughs> replacement on a kitchen three basin. Would you folks be willing to put together for us something that said, if you're doing the kitchen faucet, this is what it's going to look like. If you're doing a bathroom faucet, this is what it's going to look like. If you're putting in a bubbler, this is what it's going to look like. Something, if, it, if it's going to include all the fittings, what is this going to look like? If there's something that we could get, I won't hold you totally responsible yeah. for it, but I, I'm looking at What if that's not the cause, would be yeah. my question. Right. What if it's the pipe, piping underneath that comes to that faucet, which is more or less what's going to be? Not, not, the, 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 it, not the, this, this much distance, literally, that the water passes through of the brass that it's touching, the wetted surface of that brass, but the 200 feet of wetted surface before it that is copper pipe with leaded solder. So now we've gone to do this, except we haven't done anything about the actual problem. Just, just curious what we do then, because that, that cost is, in, 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 is gonna be incredibly high. And there's the percentage that that's the problem, and then there's the percentage that it's just the faucets. So, so I'm seeing some questions here. He was before me. So. No, you. So, okay, I'll one, go. Two. So, okay. thank you, three gentlemen, for three. providing a practical uh, yes. perspective. You might get the most valuable testimony award. Um, <laughs> what codes and uh, laws are we currently ignoring? Do you, know, can you, do you have any examples of them? Of, uh, Make sure the camera's on for this part. Uh -oh. <laughs> and you're on the spot. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what is it? What was the question? You said, you said we're currently ignoring certain laws and codes. So, now, I'm so not sure I said ignore, I said we're not policing them. Okay. So there's no, there's no, no, nobody inspecting the work that's being done. No mm -hmm. one is inspecting all of the work that is being done. Does that answer your question? We do not have officials in the state of Vermont to inspect all of the work that's being done. Very, if you look at Massachusetts, for example, they do. They even require a permit and inspector for a residential home. We do not have that. We have an inspector who does a region of more than three quarters of the state. Wow. Um, Representative Austin. Just can a plumber designate someone as long as, like any of you, to do that work if you were under their supervision, if they would sign on? Do they have anything like that? Well, uh, the, I, I'm not sure how to answer the question. I mean, in the, the law is, is that um, you can have up to, a licensed plumber can have three <coughs> apprentices, per se. I think in the school system, though, you're going to find that there just isn't that that no, you, level of skill. The only right? school that I know of that have actual master plumbers on staff or Essex High School has one. Burlington, and Burlington has a few, um, maybe bigger schools. That like might Burlington, even be it. That, that might be it. But they can designate to other people in the school who, who know plumbing that we can say you can do this. Mostly maintenance. Technically, by code, no. No, okay, no, I just want to know technically. But again, know that's yes not no. enforced. Yeah. And we can't afford to do that because we don't have skilled laborers yeah coming out of any tech trade schools that were taken away almost 17 to 20 years ago. <laughs> and we have a very big issue there. Uh, so good luck finding somebody. So I just wanted, you were commenting on that as well. Could you, could, I, I didn't hear you. Um, I'm not sure what, what, just. 
Yes. Not responded to the question as well. No, yeah, we just don't have. I mean, we have their master plumber in Essex High School, and Burlington has a couple master plumbers. But as far as schools having on staff plumbing, I'd actually still like to add something. It just doesn't that. happen. They, they can't afford them uh, mm. to hire them. Uh, the rate that they can make out in yeah. private industry is not what you can afford to pay them in school. Right. I think I'd like to add something to that if I, if I could. One more thing. Um, give me one minute. Um, I need a I need a chair. For our I am passionate about this issue for many reasons. 17 years of business ownership is one of them. And I closed my plumbing business due to the lack of skilled laborers mm -hmm. to do the work, period. So I don't even, at the school level, we have less than what a company has to do the work. And right now, I don't even have a vendor that I trust to come and do the work that have skilled laborers to do it. So we could call New England Air, we could call Vermont Mechanical, we could call this. And they may have a kid who's just got out of high school and had no formal experience show up on the door. And that's and they may have someone who's had a lot of experience show up on the door. But if you ask the business owners that own plumbing and heating businesses, they're gonna tell you the same thing. They don't have skilled people. You wanna to get to, to represent a common? First of all, all you gotta do is watch a YouTube video, right? <laughs> <laughs> For anything. <laughs> that is what got us into this mess. <laughs> so uh, my question is, um, you're concerned about the distillate water system within a building. Um, Bruce, in, in the experience in Edison Central, did any of the tests show that it was anything beyond the fixtures? Uh, yeah, in the high school in particular, we have uh, uh, you know, you're familiar with it, where the pizza kiosk is in the cafeteria, we had to put in a hand, hand wash sink by code. Uh, we tapped off of an old uh, fountain line that runs miles through the ceiling. Uh, and so, so that came back, tested as high. And then on the flush sample, it came back as high as well. Uh, and the reason for that is because the piping to get to that doesn't go anywhere else. It just goes to that fountain, and it's fairly long run. Yeah. Or that that hand wash thing. Yeah. So it, it never really gets fully flush. You'd have to flush it for five minutes to get a good second drop sample. Yeah. Well, but the same question also you can. Let's have, have Lyle respond yeah. as well. But just to be clear, out of nine buildings, yeah. and however many taps were tested, you only found one that really showed evidence that it was anything beyond the fixture. Yeah. I, but I think as Lyle and kind of both stated once you once you start doing flushing the you know, once you start taking samples by the time you're you're done you've flushed the majority of the problems anyway. Yeah. Lyle, did you experience? Any we've had we've had um, some testing that um, we felt was in the piping or in a valve way downstream that we would have had to have chased and the levels that this was quite some time ago were not as high and it was in a boiler room where nobody was going to drink. So we didn't chase that one down too, too far. But again, I think the, the nature of the sitting water in a line like that that doesn't get exercised, it was probably the culprit. Again, I talked to the guy that I go to for uh, expert uh, advice on stuff like this, Tom Roido from ATC Associates that we've spoken about. And he had done some projects that he referenced um, finding lead and that was higher than they liked in the sampling and taking and replacing the faucets did in fact get them the results that they were looking for which was good news to me with a you know a school that has older piping in it with old solder joints um, i don't think that'll always be the case i think you're going to find sometimes that it's not just the faucet that particular case study was uh, an, a chinese made faucet that probably had no business being in that college dormitory um, I guess my, my gut is that we just don't know enough. We don't have enough case studies of schools of different ages um, that have gone through the entire process to say this amount of money per square foot in a building that's constructed in this year is typically going to take care of that building's needs. 
we don't have enough information on going from start to finish to remediation to really put good numbers on what this true cost is going to be for Vermont schools, and that scares the heck out of me. Do we know if um, imported uh, fixtures have the same, they're checked for the same standard as the American? They are not. I highly not doubt, checked. no. So, so we don't know. No. In a lot of the schools, I think, buy their plumbing supplies, a lot of them, not all of them, um, from Supply Works, which is a traveling sales guy uh, that most of us know, Dan, um, who is very good about making sure that we have the right parts and the right lead laws are uh, followed. However, it's not cheap. Um, and th that's where his numbers for the kitchen faucets are very expensive, but they're all they meet the lead laws, and that's why we buy them from him. You get into a mixing valve when he's talking about the hot water. You, you, when's the last time you changed the big mixing right, valve so for a shower? Like a lead that's, free that's mixing valve box. for a typical high school of 400 kids is about six thousand mm dollars -hmm. without labor. Yeah, it's scary numbers. And that is a, a hot water. That's on the hot water, which we're not talking about testing, but it's required because it's in the portable water system. A lead-free mixing valve is six thousand. Why would it, why would we need that? So that's an anti-scald valve okay. um, for tempering of water so that it protects everyone as the hot water faucet from being scalded. Representative Elder. Um, if you wanted to identify which fixtures or faucets in a building were older than 2012 when you've mentioned some of the lead-free laws coming into place, would there be a reasonably efficient way to at least inventory those in a school? Can you answer that? There's no date code on them. It, no, there's symbols that have been mm -hmm. that have been stamped on the valve and brass bodies. But to my knowledge, there's no standard symbol for for this um, across the boards. But certain manufacturers have and, and I believe the EPA, I think I actually brought that there's a handful of symbols that are used for low lead or lead free, which all meet this standard of 0 0.025, um, 0 .0, point, it's basically 0.2% lead. Right, and so record keeping within the school wouldn't be of help there yeah, in most you, cases. You think that, I mean, I could tell you in, in Allenbrook School, Every faucet there was 1996. That was the year of construction, and nothing had been changed. So, so anything case, it's that easy. it was very easy in that case. I can tell you when we went through the renovation in the other school, it would have been fairly easy too to, to look at a 1954 fixture and go, "That's original." Uh, it's just easy to see, you know, right. just the, the style and the design of them. Um, so I think you probably could take a pretty good educated guess as to what year it was based on the year of construction if it looked like it was original equipment or not. But you wouldn't know if it was lead free. Well, in 2012, you would know. But, well, but, not, likely, but not yeah, necessarily yeah. because, yeah. But because, I mean, we just had a, a, sh a sink shipped to us from Pennsylvania. It comes with a faucet. It was not lead free. That was this summer, August, in August, <coughs> through a major distributor here, Kittredge. If you've never heard of Kittredge, heard of Kittredge. So Kittredge purchased the sink. They didn't, it comes from the manufacturer with a faucet. If you're not policing it and the young plumber that's there is kind of just doing his job, that gets hooked up, boom, it's in place. And uh, there's no way to tell at this point. Well, if you, if you, I'm just curious why that's allowed under the National Safe Water Drinking Act. That seems like it's in violation of the 2015 lead-free brass. It not, it doesn't meet the same standard as Vermont and California use for low lead, is my understanding. Okay. Still, it still is, does meet the Drinking Water Act standard, hmm. which was put in place in 86, right? Or 91. Well, I think it was updated in 2014 to meet the Vermont code. So I, I think nationally we're where Vermont moved in 2009. Right? That's what I, I had read. Anyway, sorry, Jim. So since you guys have the best idea of how much work this is going to take, uh, what are the logistics? How long is it going to take to test every school in Vermont? <laughs> oh, 
five years. If you're relying on uh, in-house staff, it's it's gonna and you you're proposing on doing it only while school's in session, uh, and that's with eight hours sitting with time. an eight-hour sit time. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it will be difficult to get it done. In we're gonna have year. to test off that off hours because you can't get a because we have custodial staff that's there till eleven o'clock at night. So it's going, going on until probably ten. So if you want eight hours, you're gonna have to get up pretty early in the morning to do any you know reasonable number of samples that haven't been touched yet. Yeah. You'll have to do it Monday weekend. morning. Yeah. We did the majority of ours on the weekend. Uh, but again, all this time this can all be going on all at the same time. The pressure is more on the lab. Are going to get all of this? Yeah, you're I'm, all going to be working at the same time. Yeah, if we're all working at the same time. Go, we'll definitely swamp the lab. I'm just um, wondering, and I asked this question the other day, and I definitely didn't know if a, if uh, a system is sampled, let's say early in the morning, let's say it gets a 15 action, whatever the action is, mm -hmm. can you figure out, let's say if it's flush and then it comes back at two or three, how long, how long before that uh, tap would get back up to 15? How long does the water have to sit to get back to the back uh, pre-flood level? They say minimum of six hours, so it could be six to eight or longer, I'm assuming, but I think it just depends on what, how much lead is in that area of the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to put it's a hard. on it. It, it is. Hard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I am interested in <clears throat> if we could get a little bit better picture of what some of those fixture costs would be since we're talking about different kinds of fixtures. Sure. That obviously, and if you could help us with that. I really, that's a call to Dan Shaughnessy. Dan Shaughnessy? Yeah, I, gave you, I think I gave you his number last time we spoke. And that's a lot of the schools that buy their supplies from him because he specializes in schools and hospitals and he knows what you need and often we need odd little drinking fountain parts that you just don't buy at the hardware store. And he knows to, that we can only use lead for any products. Uh, well, two things. One, I would just say that we did have testimony from uh, the business manager where Bruce works that at three parts per billion action level, we estimate remediation compliant with S40 as written to a cost between eighty and $100,000 conservatively. This assumes replacement of fixtures only, but does not include plumbing and replacement costs, costs of distal piping. Um, so I did put that out there. As a, as a I, I could probably get you the number that it cost our school to uh, replace all the faucets during the $20 million renovation that we just completed. I would have to go to Thomas and say, okay, how many fixtures did we change? What were the cost of those fixtures? And that would give you a, a fixture and a labor cost for the great. plumbing company who did that renovation. But I'm hearing a, a, a perhaps an even bigger looming problem from you. I just wanted to sort of make sure I'm on the right track here. Uh, that if we are including child care centers, we're talking about 1,500 locations. Many of them big schools, many of them small schools, maybe just an in-home child care, a broad range. Uh, but what you're saying is, I, I, we, I sort of made a to always ask, well, who's going to do all this? And you're right. saying the, the plumbers to do all this work don't exist. They don't. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. that, that and are we talking cool. about lavatory faucets? Yes. Yes. No, yeah. take care All right. So there's ten of them in the men's and women's bathroom. Are we talking about replacing? as the bill is currently written, potentially, but we're not necessarily discussing the hot water side, which is where the most lead is coming from. In the current draft. That's interesting. Well, most people don't drink, turn on the hot water to drink, so order everybody cooks bottles. with it, so it's oh, going in the food. Yes. And that, that's what the kids are eating. Since I've been in this room and learning, I don't use hot water to, to cook. Pressure <laughs> 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 faucets, too, ahead of time. Yeah. 
flush your faucet. Yeah. That's probably the, the single thing that you, the biggest thing. beneficial thing that you can do is to flush the faucet. We just did that for right now until we figure this out. That, a lot of schools that would do. be a good break. I've heard that strategy. Yeah, especially after a long break, a Christmas break or something like uh -huh. that. The custodians will be instructed to go in early in the morning and let things run yeah. before kids get in. Just enter them. Yeah. Would you like to? Another issue that's come up money-wise is um, the need for uh, perhaps additional manpower at the Agency of Education. Um, they're claiming that they're the best point people to coordinate with schools to sort of get the word out, educate those who are going to be doing the work. Um, that they, you know, the health department is really good at what they do, but in terms of coordinating and interfacing with schools, the AOE really should have somebody that, to handle that end of things. I don't know if you have any comment on that. I'm just curious if you had a reaction to that. Uh, I don't interface with the AOE directly much. Um, I do hear from you know, the business manager and the superintendent on occasion that they feel the AOE is uh, sometimes difficult to get a hold of. I haven't dealt with them since, since Kathy Lindendorf left, so right. I have too much. Yeah, we don't have, we don't have, there's no facilities representation right. Right. in the AOE at this point. <laughs> so each of the three of you are from different school districts? Correct. And have you any clue as to how much has been budgeted so far for next year's. You still have work to do, I'm assuming. We have work to do. I, I, can, I think I can speak pretty confidently that school districts statewide have not budgeted for this problem. Uh, yeah, we, everybody carries, or everybody should carry some funding to replace a water fountain or a sink, but that's more for to replace something that's damaged, uh, not necessarily looking for something that's still functioning uh, to be replaced. We do know that our uh, licensed child care facilities are required to do water testing at the time of their licensing. Are there requirements that you're aware of at this point to do testing, or are you just... No, we, we began our testing uh, really through Middlebury College. They have a, you know, an environmental science program that um, had the equipment and the desire to come test, and uh, the professor there tested every outlet in our district, uh, which was a great benefit to us because it showed us where we had some issues. But prior to that, two years ago, um, I had never been asked to do any water testing. Not on the radar? No, not on the radar. In the schools that uh, I... Oh, I'm sorry. Just go ahead. Um, other than, I would say, other than schools who run wells, I mean, then they're required by the state to do. Yeah. In the schools that I've run, I have called back in the day Gary Galka and just said, hey, I, I want to test a few random water fountains in my school just to get a snapshot of where I'm at and, and his response would always be that's that's a great idea but it wasn't anything I had to do uh, it's become more of a standard practice for me to, to test water fountains and um, just because it makes good sense to me to, to do that but it wasn't anything I was aware that it was a requirement that I do a certain amount or percentage of them or anything. So would you agree um, it should be the policy of the state that we are testing water in school regardless of the, the different features that we get there would you all agree that this is something that we should be required to do? I mean in, in the end yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the best thing to do for the kids is to get to a, as low a number as feasible uh, with the infrastructure you have to work with and if the infrastructure you have to work with is in really poor condition and, and not giving you good numbers, it's time to come up with some capital plans and, and find some money to start working towards making it better. But this, it, it, depending on where that number that you pick, the action level, it makes us very nervous about how we're gonna, we're gonna present our case to the parents. Uh, we found that this information out and now we've gotta fix it with what money? <laughs> right, because if you, you come back and say, you know, now you now you need to replace, you know, 
500 fixtures in your district, um, you know, how many <coughs> school instructors is that? You know, how, how are we going to pay for it? It's not uh, not necessarily easy to find in the budget. I you know, feel that we try hard to keep the budget reasonable. Um, Do you keep track of paint and dust? Lead, um, lead paint? Yeah. Yeah. And, and dust or anything in the soil or anything like that? Um, monitor that at all? Currently don't test the soil. We, we were, uh, you know, the state came through on a pilot project to do, you know, PFOs, um, some soil testing, and we, we had a school in that pilot. Um, but we <coughs> haven't been required to do any of that. Kind of Representative Elder and then Representative Cooper. How common are the water bottle filling stations in your schools just we're hearing that those yeah. have a filter on the end and that they're in some cases are lead free in terms of the fixtures themselves so i'm just kind of wondering i guess my angle on this is we did hear from um professor costanza robinson at the testing in your district that um you know some low cost options in some cases was to actually remove certain uh faucets if there's just more than are necessary, so I'm just kind of curious, you know, how, how, how many of those you have in each school, would you say? Uh, well, I, I can tell you, like in our high school, we have uh, you know, 10 drinking fountains, you know, accessible in the hallway uh, that we've, and we've changed them all. We, we had a couple that were in a locker room or in a fitness room that we've disabled and disconnected um, they, because it would, they can go to one out in the hallway that's close by uh, saved us the cost of having to change that in those locations. Uh, I don't think there's a standard for... There, there is a requirement of how many you have to have with number of students. Yeah, occupancy. based on the occupancy. <coughs> right. And yeah. you, have to have, uh, you have to have one located in the cafeteria. Do you have a sense of what that is? I don't remember the number. I mean, we, we, we have more than enough, and we have a lot of the bottle filling stations. They're very popular, and they get exercised a lot, too, which is right. good. Um, so if you shut down every non-bottle filling station outlet in your school, <laughs> then you wouldn't have enough. But we, we really do strive to work towards getting the, the old ones out and replace them with the filtered ones with the filling stations. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a water bottle. And however, the filtered ones are a carbon activated filter which doesn't remove lead. But they are so filtration is a big that's a that's kind of a, <coughs> another issue that you're if a filter is not a filter, so to speak. Um, and boiling water won't remove lead as well. So lead is generally only removed by certain filters and I'm not a scientist but if you look at like a reverse osmosis water <laughs> filtration that will remove most of the lead but a carbon filter won't water softeners do remove some carbon filters I believe do remove some but they're not going to remove it all and that would um, Getting rid of you know, filters won't really be the any kind of answer in my opinion comes to that and I think it's about a water filter fountain per 25,000 square feet ish and uh, just you know the filters uh, in question for these filling stations are $80 a piece so it, it does cost us in our operating budget a fair amount of money every year to to change filters and if you're in a high school or a middle school that's got a decent amount of students in it you'll go through them faster than you think they do about 3,000 gallons before they need to be changed and it's shocking how fast that little red light blinks and it's also, they're very much aware of the red light blinking, and they will let you know it's time yeah. to change the filter. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We do get calls. Yes. And we had 44,000 water bottles basically uh, filled in our school at the, and for Jen's at the high school in one year. How many? 44,000. Yeah. We added up the, uh, all the, whole all the displays yeah. and, 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 and so, and, uh, you know, that was kind of a rough guesstimation of what we were. And that's originally why we started changing the plastic these bottles. is to get rid of plastic bottles. And that is why they count them is to say, okay, we just saved 44,000 plastic bottles. Um, right. Kind of the idea of the whole counter. You, sir, believe we should be testing every building in the state, is that right? I think if we're going to get a good measuring stick of where we're at, we should be testing where we eat. Um, 
the I heard someone say something about the dirt and the paint and all of that. Wherever the causes of lead to children are, is kind of where I think, and it starts at home. But yes, every single building, even if you just did one single test where it comes into a building, regardless of how big it is, or from that lead piping, uh, you'd have a pretty good idea of where the lead might be throughout the whole state. How much time and money is that going to be? <laughs> well, I mean, that could be a self-test, too. I, that's that's right. One bottle versus two. Um, you know, I don't believe our uh, municipalities are required to take a flush sample when they do their lead testing every three years. That's, a sim that's one sample from the same houses that they wanted tested in 1986. So municipalities take a, a 90 percentile approach to testing a community. They say, okay, this they'll take one sample from these particular addresses. They've been doing that in Virgin's Paint and Water for several decades from the same exact places to get their lead levels that they go by every three years. That's like pulling the same fire alarm every test and not going around to all of them. <laughs> but no, you can't do that. <laughs> so I guess it's ultimately, you can. But, but it might cost, it might cost <clears throat> as much to do that as it would as to open the can of worms of having to replace so every single. Ultimately, faucet. what I mean to ask you three yeah. is, what would you have us do? Test hot water, and and test every building you can possibly think of that people are going to be in there consuming water. Hot water is in, in kitchens <clears throat> is the first thing that comes to mind to me that we're not addressing, that we're cooking our food in. And if you read some of the causes of lead, it, a lot of it comes from uh, cooking it's and awesome. eating in our food and not as much from water consumption. So hot water in the kitchens makes sense to me. That's fine. And that's easy enough. It's a small area to, you're going to change the faucet, you're going to change the hot and the cold anyway. Yeah. It's, then you're just worried about the piping going to it. Definitely, uh, it would be great to be able to give a test kit to every home in Vermont and say, give us a first draw, throw it in the UPS truck and send it in. I don't know that there's, I don't know what the levels of lead in, in young children in the state are, if there's that much concern. And if, you know, homes are really contributing that much, I have no idea. Children are tested at age one or two. Yeah. Children are tested for that. It seems to me if the, if the levels were alarming, they probably would be <coughs> advocating for testing in homes to find out what the source is. And it probably would be the homes, not the school, I'm guessing, but um, we don't know. There's a lot of home, or there's a lot of places in Vermont that are um, probably in more need than some of our areas. I think that our school district hits the per child cap, and it's because we have been uh, thinking ahead of most of this stuff for many, many years and trying to in, to upgrade our infrastructure. There's probably a lot of older schools that are in much worse shape that could benefit from the money, um, similar to how when we're consolidating, we're sharing, I would assume that this would be the same type of type of thing, not to take money away from us, but I think there's probably buildings in the rest of the, the, the state that could use more help than us in some cases. I did 40, 40 fixtures in our district and came up with negative um, on every single one. We had less than 0 .03 parts per billion and only like three fixtures out of 40. And those were kitchen and fountains. Those were the only ones I did were kitchen and fountains. And I did them in November, uh, September. Yeah, I would say that I've been targeting um, areas where people drink, so water fountains and places where we cook, so at kitchens. And we've actually asked principals to um, not have students and staff drink from classroom sinks um, or bathrooms. Uh, just the, the precautionary to try and, and do this, you know, it's staged um, kind of progression. Uh, so it's uh, a little more 
I, achievable. And I actually called my food service lady who's testifying here today, and she does a lot of um, schools. She does the North Addison Northeast and Addison Northwest, which is Mount Abraham Convergence area. And I asked her about who puts hot water in to cook. And she said, Ken, I've never thought of it. That's amazing, I've never thought of it. But I'm gonna tell them it's time to start using cold water. And I called her supervisor at one school and she said, yep, hot water. It takes less time to boil. Yeah, I've always been in that <laughs> And so <laughs> I, I only needed to do that. I was like, okay, see you later, thanks. <laughs> and uh, that kind of concerns me because my child goes there and eats the pasta. And I'm thinking that could be where he gets more of it than anything because I know we send him with a water bottle and he doesn't drink too many of those in a day. So I'm just, and we did remove all the fountains in our elementary schools in the classrooms. We removed them in September after I did the testing just because, as a I'm, precaution. I'm guessing that if you did the, the study of the daycare centers, you're gonna find a lot more um, cheap faucets that are in these daycare centers where they quickly put together a bathroom and put the cheapest fixture in there they can possibly find, and those are probably where you're gonna get some pretty heavy hits, which would worry me more. They are, they are required to be tested now, and, and the level is at 15, so at least we have some, we don't have the 300s. Um, so at the moment, the way it's, the, the current bill is written, we haven't marked it up at all at this point. We just have the Senate version. Um, it, it's basically looking at testing everything. If we were to instead just test, you know, in year one, <coughs> first line right. of faucets, you would recommend that it be the cooking. Any food prep areas. Any food prep, yep. and what else? And drinking fountains. And drinking fountains. So if we just did food prep and drinking fountains, that would hit the majority of the problem for year one. Yes. Uh, food prep, hot and cold. You know, maybe drinking fountains, cooking, and one faucet at the farthest end of each wing of similar type of faucets. So you've got a snapshot of the ones in the classroom, but not all of them. And it's just a tremendous amount of testing. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the thing that that once you flush one, you actually sort of flush a little bit more down the line, which just, I don't think we've been thinking about. The test is going to keep getting weaker and weaker and yeah. more. Yeah. Other questions? Representative Cooper? Are you three familiar with the bill that we're talking about? Yes, sir. Yes. Because we're trying to answer those, generally those four and a half categories or five categories. Right. And um, well, Mike... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I would say your timeline that I read in the bill does does not. Uh, we have not had time to budget for that. Mm -hmm. So that, and then you come to cost. Uh, well, we don't have money to pay for that <laughs> because we have not been able to budget for that. Um, and then this, just the sampling that's laid out in the bill, I think, is a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, difficult for schools to meet that. And the testing, it's. I wonder if they could even test that. Yeah, samples. I have no idea what the lab capacity right. is. But. It, I think that for a school district with say 800 kids, um, for for 800 kids, you're probably looking at around three thousand dollars to test 40 fixtures, which may very well be the fountains and the kitchens. That doesn't include the hot water, so maybe add 50 and another 500 dollars. But based on what it costs me to do for 800 kids, that's what I would that's what I would say. And that's just simple, that's not addressing some of the other things like timeline of having it done and or if you do find a problem, that's kind of where we're all like, oh my gosh, if you find a problem in 10 days, you gotta tell the public, now what are you gonna do? Or are kids gonna, right. parents yeah. gonna say, I'm not sending my kid to the school because of this. Yeah. And so that is a huge concern that we're sitting here, the reason why we're sitting here is because we're gonna cause this outcry and and but we won't have a we won't have a way, way to get out of it, it or pay for it. <clears throat> but ultimately, we all, I'm sure, in this room, don't want lead in our water or anything for that matter. 
no question about it, we want zero um, and or something in place to change the culture that we have in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the infrastructure that we're doing. I think our goal is no lead. No lead. <laughs> Um, it's a matter of, of how we get there. Yeah. Right. What's the best way to get there? No lead. I'd like to be carbon neutral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's some that type too. of <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> some some type of investment grade audit. And for lack of better terms, that's what I would think, because there's so many different cases and scenarios, and not everyone's on uh, the same same page there. We're not all in the same We don't all have the same circumstances. Um, Michael O'Grady, O'Grady from Legislative Council made a suggestion. I don't want to say suggestion, but he said contracting could be a possibility with some out-of-state group. Is that possible? It would likely have to be an out-of-state group. <laughs> We don't have that many contractors in state. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah right. I think we'd be looking at someone from out of state, and, and I would assume that the inherent inefficiencies of that would absorb most of the yeah. uh, money that would be allocated. Yeah, you could solve most problems with time and money. So. Yep. <laughs> there are no. If it were an out of state contractor, would they have to be supervised by a Vermont? They would have to be licensed in Vermont. Licensed. Yes, they'd have to be licensed yeah. Yeah. in Vermont. No rule that other than well, they, they on the school the grounds, supervision. they'd have to be uh, supervised uh, essentially for safety for reasons. Security, security, yeah. security. Yes, security. I can't it's think of any other rules. Right, and background checks we would require. Contractors. Or you have to have one of your people accompany yeah. them. Right, which, which you might would, as well just do it yourself. Again. Right, <laughs> which still takes that person <laughs> out of the right. equation. Yeah. For they're not moving here. snow. No, <laughs> they're not moving snow. They're not. They're not doing so. I think that's another concern all of us have. <clears throat> I've only been doing this for a year and a half, and the one thing that strikes me s the most is that I have no staff. <laughs> and when I had a business, I couldn't get people skilled to do the work. And now I, I've realized that I don't have the staff to do the work either. It's an interesting kind of... Uh, you need to talk to uh, some of the students and get them into that profession. Yes. So I understand there's a bill that is in the house right now to get technical education um, in fifth grade and up. Yeah, there there could not yeah, be a smarter thing happening <laughs> in this state in house than there's that. A, there's a pilot going on right now for, fifth, for yeah, seventh grade. Yeah, that, yeah. for anything between five and ten <coughs> grade yeah. would be just um, absolutely yeah. amazing. Perfect. Well, Bruce, Bruce and I have been talking about a mentoring program for facilities directors because we find the people from the trades come in, do the job, get completely overwhelmed by all the different things that come at them, and they go back to the trades because it's easier to concentrate on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you thought that you could get us um, the, the spending that you went through. Yes. That would be really helpful. Yep. Can you get it to us in about five minutes? <laughs> uh, it could be 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As soon as you forget it, yeah. we'd greatly appreciate it. I will hunt sure. it down. And you, you also, well, you, and you did, do you have a sense of your, anything that you can give us on your remediation sure. and the cost of remediation? And, and if you could break it down so you could kind of see the pieces would be incredibly helpful. Our poor uh, joint fiscal office was said, okay, just go and figure this out. <laughs> To do that. <laughs> right. So. Well, I would say that if, if whatever decision is made, uh, schools, you know, we work on such a fixed budget that if you say there's cost sharing, uh, I would I would ask you to cap whatever the school's cost sharing is at whatever is in the document. Um, otherwise, it, it, I'm afraid things will just mushroom. Yeah. We're well aware of unfunded mandates. Yes. <laughs> when we're dealing with lead in water, it gets really tricky. Yes. Is there anything that you'd like us to ask at this point? <laughs> Where are we going to get the money? Yeah. 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 Right on this next. Okay. We've already tested for that in the air. Yeah. The water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I'm sure Shannon shares what everything is. Okay. It's all been oral. Yeah. Right. So, I've got my little notes in purple. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. I just, um, Jeff Francis, Superintendent Association, I simply wanted to remind the committee 
that you have in front of you experienced school facilities managers, and not every school system in Vermont has one. Sure. So when you think about the answers that you're getting and their ability to respond to questions based on their years of experience and what they know about the profession, one feature in Vermont is that not every school system has somebody with this level of credential. So I, you know, I think that whatever bill you pass, these folks will be uh, relatively well equipped to contend with it, especially if you give them what they need. But there will be places that don't have a person like this who even when you give them what they need will be challenged to respond because they don't have somebody who's doing the job that these gentlemen do. We did have these folks in last week, so we're well aware that not everybody is like these folks. <coughs> um, just checking to see if there's... Beth, did you... I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to ask you. a question. Well, I won't ask a question. I, I've had the fortune to talk to a few of these gentlemen here. So just the for the record, Beth? Beth Novotny for the uh, Mosaic Learning Center. What I will say sort of echoes what Jeff just offered the committee. You've just heard from the public school <coughs> facilitators and the independent schools, I remind you, are different. They don't own their buildings, they lease their buildings. The ability to rip out fixtures or change fixtures depends often on landlord approval to do this, pursuant to the terms of a contract or lease. Our school does not have a cafeteria service because we serve students with neurological differences. They come with their own prepackaged food for a very specific reason. Um, so there is a uh, cafeteria worker cooking up meals for the, for the students. So every school will be a little bit different, and therefore the cost is different. And I, as I said, what's unique about our building is there's a whole third floor with former <laughs> convent rooms that have in-suite bathrooms with faucets that we don't think we need to test because staff and students don't access that entire area. And, and so you're going to have to, I hope, consider uh, that not, it's not a one-size-fits-all as we move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I said that I'd bring the committee some language. I hope to do that, uh, that provides you the ability to sort of balance the competing interests a little bit. But keep in mind, not every school is a public school that where you can put to the taxpayers a budget that can be approved. We don't have that flexibility in our world to simply raise the rates or somehow or other sell more widgets. It just doesn't work that way. There's not a taxpayer group budget. So if we did do some limiting as to what the fixtures that were tested, food prep ones, the water fountains, would that? I think that's a good starting point. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and I think it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about two thousand dollars per fixture. You think it's two thousand per fixture? I would soundly say that given and the cost of average? a given the, well, even a water fountain because like oh, yeah. you mentioned Absolutely. a water fountain's twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, you know, that's okay. if you buy a wholesale. So yeah, you you so we've got little fixtures. <laughs> we have lab yeah, yeah. yeah. So so food service fixtures yeah. and um and water fountains, two thousand. Hand sinks. Um, and that doesn't count the lead testing or the labor to test it. That's simply just the replacement of it. I would say a thousand for or or seven. I would say a thousand for lavatory hand washing because most people use the hands free, which are seven six seven hundred dollars, uh, probably eight hundred dollars to do so. Anything you can do to make that a little bit more. That's in written or to direct this to the person who can answer that. You know, if you hear the kind of pictures we'd be looking at, here's what the calls would be. Would be helpful. Yeah, is there, can I send it to you electronically? Is there Absolutely. a way to uh, Please do. address I can send it to you? Um, Shannon, yeah. Shannon will get everything to you. Yeah, so the, the bottle filling um, are a thousand dollars just for the they're, fixture. They're more than yeah. They're more than that actually. The wholesale cost is around thirteen hundred dollars. But wouldn't that wouldn't it make more sense just to install those maybe yeah. as opposed to just the my supplier Dan <laughs> that will sell you the, the lead free LK. He said to use the figure of about a thousand dollars, and then you've got to install it. And I'm guessing six hundred bucks for a plumber for these schools that can't. If there's no major redo of heights of drains and so on, 
I mean, that, that number is easy enough to check out, which most of them are because we just replaced two and had to reconfigure the plumbing from an old style to a new style. That's what which I brought is a thousand dollars flat out per change out for labor and um, minor plumbing parts. It depends on who you're, who's you're looking at. If it's your local plumber or if it's uh, Vermont Mechanical or something like that, the number is going to get bigger. They've got more overhead and they charge a lot more money to come in. <coughs> Yeah, do you guys have any opinion on the action level? Yes. Well, I, my mm -hmm. personal feeling is that uh, I think, you know, if, if bottled water is held to five parts per billion by the FDA, that it doesn't make much sense to go below that. Uh, yeah. It's just my personal yeah. feeling. That makes sense to us. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank this you is so really much. helpful. This Thank is a very you. important issue. We're very concerned about children and, and lead. So are we. That's why we do what we do. That's right. Thank you for your work. Um, let me get started because I know people have, have things to do here. So um, thank you, Michael Derosha. Can you introduce yourself for the record and tell us who you represent? Yep, uh, for the record, I'm Michael Derosha. I'm the executive director for the Division of Fire Safety. Uh, so we, we regulate uh, 12 to 14 trade professions, uh, including uh, plumbing. So I, it was interesting listening to all the conversation here. I actually learned quite a bit here listening to all <laughs> That's how I learned. You know, it kind of reads like it's straightforward in a sad spot after listening to everybody's testimony. It seems like quite a, quite a challenge. Um, if you want, I can kind of give you a summary of some thoughts I have. Yes. Uh, we, we're, we're also really just concerned about where a plumber needs to be involved, where right. do they legally need to be involved, sure. involved and where not. I think you'll find a high percentage of the schools uh, probably certainly aren't at this level of the three that were testifying here because we do inspections of schools. And uh, so our typical policy has been if you're exchanging a, a similar type faucet, for example, there's going to be no work notice required. Um, so um, replacing a faucet with a similar type faucet, there's no work notice. There's nothing needed uh, from our perspective. That would be considered maintenance. Replacing a drinking fountain, you get in more of a gray area if it's a similar type uh, drinking fountain, it's going in at the same height, and you're not having to extend the water piping and all this, then there would be no work notice required on the exchange of a similar type uh, drinking fountain. So the key here is where does the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire Safety, draw the line on maintenance versus through statute the art of plumbing? And typically, uh, if you're getting into bringing an old um, plumbing system up to cold, then you would need to have a licensed master plumber file a work notice. And as these gentlemen uh, stated here, the permit fees for plumbing are, are minimal. And so when you add all, I can actually send over here our fee schedule, uh, but it's not a, um, it's not a significant factor, the permit fee itself. Um, I'm not a toxicologist, but it's the conversation here here has been interesting. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of times where our plumbing inspectors uh, receive calls. So if a school is having a particular uh, situation or they're exploring something for remediation, I would encourage them to call our plumbing inspector. They will go to the site and they can offer technical assistance uh, to that particular school. 
And uh, so right now we have three plumbing inspectors. Uh, T.J. Garrow is the chief plumbing inspector. He's also the district manager out of Rutland, and he chairs the plumbing board. Uh, we have Ann Ross. Uh, she works up in the Chittenden County area, and we have John Hammer who works the northeast, <coughs> southeast portion of the state. And we have a fourth plumbing inspector that will be brought on before uh, July 1st. So. He seemed, he seemed to, it seemed to indicate that they don't feel that there's an oversight. Well, I will say, I will say this. The two, typically speaking, we do roughly 2,000 plumbing inspections a year, roughly. And if we bring on a third, another full-time employee down in the Springfield district, we'll jump that up to close to 3,000. Um, under statute, we have inspection priorities. And for example, licensed facilities are a priority. Uh, places where people eat are a priority. Um, so if schools are just changing out faucets, and there's no work notice required, there'd be nothing triggering us to go there. When schools do major <coughs> upgrades or renovations or alterations, we certainly do plumbing inspections on all those projects. So we've inspected hundreds of schools, you know, over the years uh, as a result of uh, construction projects and permits. Questions? Yes. By May. <laughs> just so I'm clear, so if, for example, we're just changing out uh, a water fountain for a water fountain, and our, our facilities guy could do it, then there's no notice required and no inspection there. But if I'm going to change uh, a water fountain, and, it, and it's going to be a bottle, water bottle filling station with, I think some of them have fountains with them. Um, it, is there a no, need for notice, even though I'm not doing exactly the same thing, but it's in purpose of roughly the same? There would probably be a notice required, and the only reason uh, I would say that is because most schools certainly are not going to engage in that type of a retrofit. Um, so they're going to hire a licensed master plumber and under the licensing rules as soon as that person is hired he's got to file a work notice if he's doing the work so there's uh, there are licensing requirements for for the plumbers um, so can I so stop you there yes. so yep. if I hire a licensed plumber even if even if we're swapping exactly the same thing a fountain for a fountain I heard you say if you hire the plumber, then you have to provide notice. Is that for a, true? For a swap out for a water filling fountain? No, no let's just say we're back to the water fountain for water fountain. No, there would be. So it's not no, the, if they hire a licensed plumber. master plumber, they can do the work, and we would not okay. uh, accept the work notice. But when I so now, if I'm in a position where I have to provide notice of the work, um, then I'm. Once I've provided notice, once I've done something that requires notice, I'm going to have to have a licensed plumber. And, it, and somewhere along the line, your shop has to do an inspection? If, the, if you're just replacing drinking fountains and stuff, the chances are our inspector is not going to go there. If it's, a, if it's part of a larger uh, project in the facility, um, the inspector will go and look at it. But if it's just a single fixture replacement or a couple, um, there's no way uh, we receive uh, thousands of these uh, plumbing work notices, um, and I'd be dishonest with you to say that they're going to go out and inspect all of these. Uh, you start getting into replacing boilers as part of carbon monoxide prevention and that kind of stuff. They're going to go inspect a heating system replacement in a nursing home or something like that versus going to a school for a water fountain. Uh, you know, so if it's a big project, uh, then they're going to go look at it. If it's a new school, it's going to get inspected. If it's an addition onto a school, it's going to get inspected. If they receive a work notice and there's 20 water coolers that are being replaced and 30 faucets and somebody decides they're going to file a work notice with us on a big project like that, they would probably stop by and inspect it. So if we 
start this program in all of the schools, it looks like it will put probably some pressure on your department. If we have schools around the state that are now seeking to do their plumbing, are you going to be staff? The, no. The, the, the reason I say no is, is that the influx, you know, the influx of an additional 500 plumbing work notices or something, we're not going to be able to respond uh, to that with extra staff. Uh, Representative Austin? Yep. Yeah. Just like as a taxpayer and having the knowledge that you have, wisdom, like do you have any, what are your thoughts on this in terms of where we should go, what would be the most efficient but keep kids safe direction? I mean, I'm, again, I don't know what the, what the problem actually is. Um, you know, we, we deal with risk every day uh, and we uh, do risk analysis every day as part of our work and, <clears throat> you know, the concept of trying to target high probability items would be the first place to start. So, for example, if you have a school that was built in 2012 or a big addition that was built, I guess I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time with that. I mean, I, I guess I would look at where the cutoff dates are <coughs> on where the new lead fixtures were, you know, they had, the lead was prohibited. I think I'd go back to there and start targeting those high probability items. You know, we, uh, we target for, say, existing apartment buildings that are more than 25 years old. Um, they're 50% more uh, chance of having a fire in these buildings, so we, we know what the risk is. <coughs> so we spend our focus more energy on those types of, of areas here, and I'm not sure, um, you know, obviously you've got water flowing through all these pipes. I learned this today, you know, all the, all this stuff today, so I'm not, not so, <laughs> <laughs> But you That's said, interesting. but what the problem is, to find out what the problem is, the yeah, scope I mean, of the problem. Yeah, I mean, so much of, <coughs> so much of our work is done uh, without data to support what our problem is. And when we're, I know as a division, with all the responsibilities, when we try to align resources, a lot of times we struggle with, we've just got poor data, and what are we throwing our resources at without having solid data? So. I'm pretty much a data person where, you know, if we're having fire fatalities in ages of 50 or higher, then we're going to focus our educational programs on people over 50. Not that anybody here is elderly. Okay. No. <laughs> or over 50. No, not at all. Or over 50. Yeah, not at all. Representative Elder. Um, if you identified multiple <coughs> fixtures that would require a notification, a work notification, is it possible to kind of say, all right, well, we've identified these, you know, we've got some work that's just going to be not not rising to the level of requiring that, but other work that is. Can you basically do one work notification that says we're doing these 12 units or et cetera, or is it really one-to-one? Sure. -one? So it can be on a job that... Yeah, I mean, right. We're, you know, we're pretty flexible. You know, as far as any paperwork or work notices being filed to us, I mean, we accept like phase-in permits with with businesses. Uh, you know, if they want to do a certain amount now and tell us we're going to do this much next year, uh, we work with people um, at all all different levels. Uh, so, um, I would also offer uh, to the committee if you. Uh, want some expert testimony other than myself, uh, we can uh, make arrangements to get uh, Gerald Garrow up here. He's the chief plumbing inspector and he chairs the licensing board. He'd be more than happy to uh, come up here and speak to you, but he's very <laughs> knowledgeable about all the, uh, the art of plumbing. So you're very familiar with the industry um, 
you know, this is clearly going to result. If we went through with the bill as written, it's clearly going to result in the need for a lot of the licensed master plumbers to come in and do some work. Are there enough of them out there to? We have approximately oh, 2,000 licensed master plumbers, roughly 500 licensed journeymen. And the issue I see here, are these are low priority, high cost jobs because what's going to happen is these plumbers are going to drive for an hour to get there, do very little work, the, mar the profit margin is, is very low, so their prices are going to go up. And to try to pull them off a commercial job where their profit margin is much higher is going to be difficult. That's my own personal opinion, I think. If, if they're available to be right. pulled off. Right. I think they're, you know, it's like, I know I've called up licensed master plumbers, even friends of mine, to do plumbing at my own house. And oh, my old friend, and it even <laughs> takes three weeks or a month to get, to get buddies uh, to come over and do the plumbing work. I can see a real, a real struggle with the licensed master plumber. So if you're talking about, this is why I think it would be important to, uh, to recognize <coughs> that replacing a faucet would not require a work notice. And if you can get somebody that is able to do this, um, you're sitting good with this monetary wise, but you know, probably 80% of your schools, and I'm just talking off the top of my head here, probably are far from this level of expertise in the schools. They, they just are. Uh, have you a preference on an action level? Do you think we should be? No, I don't. I, I'd be not doing a disservice to you to get in the action levels with you. I just don't know enough about it. Right. Very but, wise. But you did, yeah. you, know, you did mention how you don't know. do all every day. <laughs> you're not certain of the extent of the problem, so no. would you say we should go ahead and test? Everywhere, or what, what, what about testing? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, you look at look at all the new homes that are that have been built with lead-free fixtures and all this. I guess I wouldn't necessarily agree with the gentleman here that you go through every single home. But I mean, I guess I'd look at if I'm doing risk analysis. If you got a two-year-old that's been tested uh, for lead and he's got high lead, then I guess at that point there's a key. Let's go to this home and get this water tested. Um, if you got a four-year-old with high lead test, then take a look at that person's house. I mean, that's you're being spoon-fed that data that is saying there's high lead here. So, um, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the testing principles up for lead in schools or just from what I learned here, to be honest with you. Um, Interesting. It's, it's just not in my wheelhouse the toxicology aspects of lead. Uh, you work on yeah. the pipes. Yeah. Other questions? I would just add one, Chair, yeah. just one more comment, and that would be if you start getting into a lot of wall uh, mm -hmm. destruction and stuff, um, we would be like to be consulted on that. It's not saying we would require a building permit, but what it would do is we would send a fire marshal out to the site and you could be given permission on the spot to do this particular this particular work, but I would just say if you're going to start getting into demolition, taking down walls or putting a lot of penetrations only because there's a lot of firewall assemblies in our schools. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Relation to the fire marshal, could a local fire chief be a part of that inspection process? We have a uh, good question. We have four, 12, 12 active municipal inspection agreements right now where we've given authority to the local municipalities to do the inspection. So to answer your question, yes, uh, those are listed on our webpage. Uh, 
but there are major cities where probably in the school systems you're going to find they probably have a pretty good maintenance program Burlington South Burlington Montpelier Brattleboro Bennington Hartford and some others. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 I feel like I haven't helped you much after listening to all this conversation. Uh, no, this is great. No. Thank you. We have helped. No. It, it's, uh, we're, we're trying to deal with a complex situation. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It's not a straightforward, and that's usually what happens if it comes to the legislature. It's usually not easy. Um, but this is important. So, thank you. Yep. And if you need uh, GJ to come in here, that's his name. Okay. Let me know and I'll have him come up here. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. It's four o'clock. We have we have Michael O'Grady in the room. Um, I think we're kind of at the point of just having discussion about what we've just heard. Um, so it might not be worth your time to listen to us. I know you have other yeah. things that you like to do. Yeah, I am supposed to be in finance in like two minutes. Okay, oh. I say go. Okay. You don't have to listen to Thank us to figure this out. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Have you guys heard from a friend here from the Department of Health? They're right over there. there. He's right here. Oh. So did you have testimony already? We've, ha we've had yeah, some yeah. testimony. Are you, are you willing to talk to us right now? Always willing to talk. Thank you. Well, let's, let's listen because we have, I, I certainly have come up with a few ideas along the way. I live to serve, Madam Chair. Yes. So thank you. And again, we're looking at, as we're moving forward, we're looking at trying to keep ourselves focused on the cost of the problem, how much it is and who pays for it, the timeline. Um, who is included in what our action level is? And who is included is, is becoming more interesting to me as well. So in terms of what we've heard, um, do you want to say something, or should we start firing questions at you? Sure, I'll just say I'm David Englander. I'm the senior policy and legal advisor to the Commissioner of Health. And I'm <laughs> delighted to withstand your slings and arrows. <laughs> no, no arrows, just, just, just questions. Uh -huh. question, <laughs> questions, questions to help us move forward. One of the things we just heard that was very interesting to me was as we're looking at the amount of money that we have here, that we're, which we don't even have at this point, but moving forward and who's paying for things, one of the things that came forward that was very intriguing to me was the idea of not testing everything the way the bill is put, but focusing our testing first on the areas of greatest concern. Um, they've talked about, and we can discuss that, the, the water fountains, the food prep areas. And the other thing that was interesting to me that I hadn't heard before is just the idea of if you're, you know, getting the, the flush samples, <laughs> that do we really need to do it for everyone when probably the whole system <coughs> got flushed earlier? So, so I, I didn't express that very well. Yeah, objection, compound question. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so yes. So, the one, two, and then the, the last one on the line um, test for the, the, the third. Wait, so what's one? What's one? They, they talked about um, the one that's sort of farthest down the line. Oh, so yeah. I, I think questions like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer yeah. to, to somebody who, who knows things like that. I, I'm going to turn to, to, uh, to Brian Redman of PPC to see if he has perspective, because I actually I actually don't on that, on those yeah. specific questions. You want to just can you join us, Brian? Thank you so much. Kind of the dynamic duo here. Hey, for the record, uh, Brian Redmond, uh, Director for Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection. Uh, I, you know, I really like the opportunity to go back to my team to yeah. to understand their thoughts on that. There's no doubt about it that as you're that you're walk, moving water through the entire system, so yeah. to a degree, the system itself is getting flushed as you're moving through the sample protocol piece that I want to check with is that you're getting some column of water that's that's not disturbed in the fixture itself. So that first draw is still, I believe, going to be valid, but I'd like to check that to okay. confirm. And the thought of, the, and maybe this goes back to you, what if we limited, for, for the first year, we're just looking at the areas of greatest concern. This is my interest. I don't know where the committee stands on this, but I'm just asking that in terms of the, how that might affect 
Um, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's axiomatic, right? If you, if you limit the, the, the number of tests that are going to be tested, they're gonna, you're going to drive down the cost of testing as well as remediation. The question is, how do you, then I guess, if we said we're only going to do X number of, a, a, def, a more defined universe that, than the committee is currently contemplating, right. how do you do stage two in a way that's efficient? Because as we discussed, Madam Chair, the Department of Health is going to do this with testing by region. Right. So we're going to go into a, you know a part of, of the model county and a part of Orange or possibly all or all of whatever it is, and we're going to and we're going to do the testing for every every entity, every every high school, elementary school, and daycare. So I don't think we I don't think we want to be in a position collectively saying we're going to do these taps this year and then these taps next year because that'll be that there you we lose the economy of scale of, of doing it in this in this sort of geographically defined way. Didn't someone say, and I'm not sure if it was you or the agency, that said you could do a sampling, like a scientific sampling of schools and come up with a number that would show the scope of the problem scientifically? Or uh, well, I, I would say that's what the pilot was. Yeah. The pilot tested okay. every, you really, the, the issue is you really have to, you have to test every fixture because different, right, different fixtures are going are gonna to have different potentially have different outcomes. But in a small sample of schools, if you've tested every fixture. You, you still want to test every fixture that it was going to be used for, for drinking or, or, or food preparation. In the sample, right? Not every school in the state, not every fixture mm -hmm. in the state, but a, a scientific way of figuring out a sample that when you got, if you tested all the fixtures in each, all of those schools in the sample, you could extrapolate in terms of so what the scope of the problem is? I, so I think that, so and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, our, our he's not, so that's good. Um, <laughs> is that when we tested all the, the within the pilot test, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we wanted to do the pilot was because we wanted to see what is the scope of the problem. And so we tested every, we, we, we allowed schools to determine, we said to schools, you, you test what, you, what are reasonably going to be used for drinking and, and food. We didn't, we didn't come in and police that and say, well, you know, there's a bathroom at the end of the hallway that the janitor told you know. We said, you go test what you think you should test. We tested 900 caps, and then, you, and then you've seen the data from, from that. Mm -hmm. So we said, in light of what we found, no, not, not least of which was the 27 caps above 15 ppb, we do think that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to. Ted. <laughs> I mean, for the record, Ted Fisher from the Vermont Agency of Education. I do not want to speak for my colleagues at the um, Agency of Natural Resources, but in answer to the rep uh, representative Austin to your question, um, I don't know if this was said exactly in the secretary's testimony, but um, there was a conversation at one point about um, talking not actually about doing a representative sample, but of doing the, if we do the testing at the at a ac higher action level, you will have good data for all of the schools. And then, so we're not talking about doing a smaller subset of schools. We're still talking about the sampling all along. But then you would have an idea of how many, what, where, where we fall, and be able to look at low, like look at a lower action level in the future, um, and know what the cost would be of that, for example. Um, just to clarify, so. We are saying you're going to go regionally around the state. Yes. I guess my impression of the program that your department was kind of envisioning was <coughs> one in which all the testing was done locally, and I, I, I was thinking that districts would figure out how to do that testing on their own schedule and that the role of the department would really be to set up the database and, and handle that data coming in. So tell me. So that is not, that is not the case. So what's going to happen? So what's going to happen is, so in S40, the department, and the department asked for this, we asked the authority to establish a schedule for just the reasons that the gentleman mentioned, which is we can't inundate the lab. And, and the tests are only good for, six, when you take the draw, it's only good for six months. So we, we have the, under the current bill, the Department of Health would have the authority to go to, to schools to school in certain regions and say, this is when you're going to test and now we're going to come in and train you and give, all the, give you all the information. Mm -hmm. It is not on schools' own, um, it is not on schools' own, uh, uh, within the, the end of their ability to decide. Because frankly, I would be concerned that everybody can decide the day before the deadline <laughs> is time to test. And we get 45,000 samples on the day before. 
it, to be clear, the number is about 45, between 40 and 50,000. That's our estimate. Mm -hmm. 40 and 50,000. Between 40 and 50,000 tests. Yeah. So if, so, and again, I mean, we could reduce that if we just went at yes. this point with just the, the key areas of concern. Yes. I realize it's not getting everything. I realize that sometimes the kids can stick there, you know, their BPA free cups in the bathroom, not as likely. More likely you're getting it from the areas where, where it's obvious yes. that, that you drink. For sure. Do you have a sense of what that could cut in terms of, of how, would it, how oh. would it affect your time, your schedule, if we, would, if we limited it to that? Um. I, I, I'd have to like I think we just yeah. kind of try to figure 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 it out what you know what did that look like because basically we do have we have all the data from every single pack that from the 900 we have then we could probably estimate we could say well based on this size school it would mean instead of 50 caps it might only be 20, 20 caps but I, that's a I'm pulling the number out of the air. <coughs> uh, except that um, when you did the pilot you you said to the schools. Um, water sources that you would reasonably expect yes. children to drink from. Yes. So really you are talking about those areas that would be of greatest concern. Yes. So but, but some schools chose to do all the taps in the boys' bathroom oh, and all the taps okay. in the girls' bathroom. All right. So um, I have kind of a couple other just kind of bigger policy questions. Uh, gentlemen, I think um, from the fire safety department kind of said good point to, you know, to us. It's the, better, the better idea would be to gather data, assess risk, and target those areas that are of highest risk. Um, I don't know if you have any comment on that sort of philosophy as we approach this problem. I, certainly, in, in general, that's exactly the right way to approach hazards. The, and, 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 and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong. My sense of things is that it, it is a it is a tap by tap issue. So that's what's why you can't do a scientific sampling and, and extrapolate, because this banana is fine, but that banana is full of arsenic. And unless you test that banana, you don't know. And then you can't assume, because this one is got zero and that has 50, that the average is 25, or there's a 50% chance the banana is going to have something. Is that? Yeah, I would like that banana example. I, 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 would, I would agree with the analogy. Um, I think that we saw enough in the pilot that our recommendation was to test statewide. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, I mean, then you have the data mm -hmm. to then say, to then prioritize by risk, I think. Um, you, know, you, you can look at initial flush. If it goes from 12 to 0, that's not a high priority, perhaps. I don't you know, whatever. Uh, OK, uh, thank you. Um, question, and it, you know, this may be more for your boss, but if the Department of Health had two and a half million dollars, and we said, "Do whatever you want to help uh, mitigate the risk of lead in children." Sorry, Where would I you spend that it? Idea. So it's a great it, idea. It, it's a great. Oh, I thought I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, the truth is that um, there's a whole host of places we've we've talked briefly about that the, you know, the source of, of lead poisoning in children is mostly from. Pre-78 rental housing, where, where lead is, is still is still present and has been significantly sequestered. Um, it, that's an incredibly complex problem involving tens of thousands of apartments and hundreds of thousands of Vermonters potentially. The the the, the thing that about this about S40 is it is a universe. It is a problem that we can solve. <coughs> I, you know, we continue to work on um, uh, uh, lead, you know, lead paint issues. In fact, I got the numbers the other day. We actually are now, we are, I can say that we are trending down. Um, we, the numbers have actually dropped substantially over the past three years. We're hoping that that trend continues. Um, so trending down on what? I'm saying the trending down on the number of, of, <laughs> of children who are lead poisoned. So three years ago, it was something on the order of uh, 650. Last year was. 444, and this year I believe it's 406. Um, and so we're hopeful that the variety of things that we're doing with the, with the lead program as well as the, our safe homes program is 
it, it having an effect. And as you look at those kids, are there patterns that you see? Are there patterns in terms of like living in rental housing? Are they so, so it's kids, so it's mo so we are we are seeing kids in rental in rental in pre seventy eight rental housing, yeah. and the source of their <coughs> is lead paint. In fact, it's not only lead paint; it's typically lead paint in a window well. It's that it's that specific. Yeah, I did speak with a, a woman who has a child who had a high lead level, and one of her concerns moving forward is that. Um, that child is not even allowed to drink bottled water because it has lead in it. It could have lead in it. So it's into account, yeah. Do you, because I've, I've just looked at the <coughs> kind of summary report from the pilot project, and I don't know, maybe, maybe we could get the details a little, I'll just ask you about it. So did you find a correlation uh, in the 3% of samples that were over the EPA limit, the 27 out of 900, um, did those tend to be at a certain kind of fixture more than another? And I guess what I'm driving at is just having looked a little more particularly through some of the Oregon data because they really give you like what it is. Slop sinks, uh, bath sink spigots, boiler room spigots, showers, like again and again, school after school, those are the places with the 600s, the 1200s, the 4200s. Um, the faucets that are over tend to be, and again, not scientific, but just having looked through a certain number of these things, they tend to be more when they're over in the 15 to 20 range. <coughs> so I'm just kind of wondering, I would be interested to know how many of those 27 that were high are in those categories of things that are clearly not used as much only because time between usage seems to be have a linear or clear relationship with how high it's going to get. And, and so did you go? So, so I actually don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if Brian does. And we, so we can, we can get that for you. I yeah. don't know. I'm just hoping that we're using, you know, we want to use the scientific method. We also want to use common sense, right, to sort of drive at the problem as much as we can in that kind of category. Seems like it could be helpful. We could easily analyze the data. I think we, did, we certainly did have some some in that instance, we, you know, the, the Barry, some of the Barry City results come to mind. Um, Barry City has outstanding corrosion control practices, so their results for a large school generally look pretty good. But they had the chemistry room sink, which was very high, a couple hundred parts per billion. But that sink was never used; it was turned on for the sample. For the sample, so and that they column came back high. Been in there for months. months. A long time. And yeah. So we de certainly had some of those. We, we could analyze the 27 and give you an exact number. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, so I, I'm sure I'm asking you things that you've already been already talked about in here, but the 40 <laughs> to 50,000 test you talked about, that was that's all of the statewide, all of the sources that you think you need to test? That is that is all of the fixtures that could that were it's, it's an estimate yeah. based on the based on the pilot yeah. of all tests that would could reasonably be presumed to be used for could be used for drinking water or water. Okay. So that would not be testing the plumber's closet sink. Yes. I mean we would leave that to the school we would leave that to the schools <laughs> in the department of health position, we would leave that to the schools okay. Termination. If somebody asked me right or wrong, I would say I'm not your lawyer. But then I might say very quietly, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and and did you have a cost per test? Per you know, do we know? So we so it's twenty twenty dollars. So it's well, it's twenty dollars per test. Per test, yes. And so you test it twice, so it's twenty. So, so, yes. Which is factored into the fiscal now. Yes. Yeah. So, that, so that, that's the department. Because the department is the department of health lab that is doing it. So it's our fixed cost. And so, um, and so obviously you test them afterwards too to be sure that, that you corrected the problem. So there's a forty dollar cost to every for testing. So, okay. Okay. I just did the forty to fifty thousand based on the pilot. The pilot didn't include child care centers, right? Right. So does that forty to fifty thousand still include child care centers? So it, it does understand that, that that number is gonna be probably fairly minimal. So it's eleven hundred so so it's eleven hundred so the number of fixtures tested in, in the schools uh, varied between I think it was 
112 and 114 or something like that. So we just kind of said 50. So that's it. so it's probably you know again it's, it's very rough. Um, in the case of childcare centers, childcare, it's probably a small number of taps. So maybe it's. It might be one, it might be three, but, but in the end, that means it's going to be 3,300, you know, 3,300. So. And don't we have some kind of baseline data on all those child care centers anyway? We do. From the testing that they do for licensure. Yeah. So the, the oldest would be three, three years old. Is it three or is it six for licensing? So, so three. It's three years. Yeah. So the data that you ha already have on child care centers already tells us ones that are above five in the last test. And I'm assuming none of them are over 15. Okay. <laughs> and none of them would be over 15 at this point and have a license. Right. Yes, to be licensed, they have to be below 15. That's right. That's good. Yeah. No. Did you have a question? No. Do no. no. I did. So, David, as to, as to scheduling, uh, what would you do about unforeseen school closings like a snow day, for example? Like, like what? A snow day. Oh, I mean, we just we come, I mean, come back. Another. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we're all here with human beings. I mean, with sure, human sure. beings, like it's right. it's personal contact between. I mean, that's why so much. This is why it's gonna take time. It's personal contact from somebody in our office having a conversation with somebody from facilities. Uh -huh. It's not like sorry you missed it. Have to do it next time. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. We're, you know. But I think it is interesting. I think I don't think I quite got the picture that when you say regionally, you're going into that area. You're teaching the people how to how to do the samples. Is that correct? Yes. We're going to teach folks are going to learn how to do those samples. They're going to go do those samples. You're collecting them, or they're bringing them to the to we, the. So we, we are either give, we're either going to we're going to we're going to give them the box with the peanuts and the beakers. Yeah. Or we are going to go and get them. Yeah. So okay. we are going to hand we're going to handle all the logistics of the, the shipping. Okay. So it does make sense to see to see regionally. Yeah. And just to go back to clarify my, my question again, because I I'm, I seem to be slow in learning this. It would. If we did focus it on the most problematic fe features for the first year, um, would mean fewer taps and potentially more money for remediation later. Um, but, but are you saying that if they had to go back another year to finish up the rest of the fixtures, that would be a problem? That will that just, be, really just, be extreme, just be extremely extremely inefficient. It would be. Yes, because we're going to have to, you know. We're taking a second trip, and we're, the other thing is that we're, as, as I've mentioned before, like we're, everything is we are we're geared up. I mean, I yeah. sat in, you know, the, the health operations center today, Tuesday, feel mm -hmm. fine. Um, you know, it's, we, we we have you know we have forty people in a room who are talking. We're going around the room talking about logistics and finances and all those pieces. So, we, we it, so that that that's a significant resource cost, both because we've got to pay all those people. Um, but also because we're ta they're, they're taking their time away from something else. So once we're geared up, we do want to we want to keep moving. We don't want to gear down. Could, we up. could require we could require in an elementary school where kids don't necessarily read read that they might be required to fix all of those things. Whereas in a school where there's probably more awareness of where to get water, we can hold a different standard. Did that make any sense? What I just said. Yes, although yeah. we're, we're always seeking simplicity. Right. So. <laughs> Does that start? It didn't mean to be snarky. I'm trying to save money. Yes. I mean, I, I think we, we've had conversations about, you know, it not being, <coughs> you know, it's not every single tap. Yeah. It is the taps that are used for drinking, the taps that are used for cooking. Right. And that if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a sink, you know, in like, you know, that is, that's not a good use of time and resources. We could make a requirement, something related to um, to those areas that are likely to you know, be consu consuming by children. Yes. Would be the areas that need to be first addressed. Yes. You could characterize the universe. Yeah. And, and, and focus the, the pictures that are used, you know, for, for making and cooking. Mm -hmm. I, I got a quick one. Um, it, it seems like this is not a one-year process, uh, just based on everything we're hearing. I, um, I also don't, you know, we're, I, I, so, you've spun this lab with these 40 people up, I, kind of in the anticipation of this legislation passing. Um, 
what's going to happen after a year? Are you prepared to have that facility up and running for five years? I mean, I'm just thinking, what is, wh where do they, what data set are these schools going to plug into for subsequent rounds of testing, and who's going to manage it to make sure they don't se send you all 45,000 samples on the same day? Because they're not just going to test one year, right? Well, so it depends. So, and this is a point that the chair and I have spoken up, which is that so in seeing with the meeting yesterday. We think the Department of Health and, 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 and DC agrees um, that I've also spoken with my, my colleague at, at AOE. Um, we think we can do everything in, in a year and a half. So what we'd be looking for, the Department of Health, DC, the state would be looking for um, a deadline of December 31, 2020. Provided that we get that passed. Pro provided, yeah. yes. Yeah. What, sorry, what do you mean by done everything? I'm sorry, that we can do, I, thank you, that we can do all the testing that the testing can be accomplished by by the end of next year. We, we can test all the schools and all of the um, and all of the daycare, the child care. But they start to do remediation. Don't we want to keep testing? So we we don't need as big an infrastructure to do to, to do that. And maybe Brian could speak to the, what was needed in when we were doing the remediation part of the pilot. Mm -hmm. Well, the remediation it wouldn't be within that 18-month time frame. So you, we'd do all the initial sampling. Some some facilities would be into remediation. The requirement currently is to take that outlet out of service until it's been remediated and retested. So it's, it would happen outside of the time frame, but they would not be able to be able to put that outlet back in service until it's remediated and retested and proven safe. Mm -hmm. and for the child care centers, we, we have a plan for the schools. You have someone that can do the testing. What would be the plan for addressing the child care centers? So the Department of Health would work with DCF. Okay. The, the, the licensing entity within DCF. Okay. And they, and they support this approach. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'm trying to find a way to get more money for remediation. That's what I'm trying to find the money for. Yes. Reminded me of my question on that. Mm -hmm. um, so from a, you know, a public health triage point of view, um, I, I understand your argument that you want to go into a region and, and test all the facilities, whether they're public schools or, or tracking centers, but would it make sense to target um, child care centers with the younger children um, because of our understanding that that's the highest risk group for exposure to lead um, statewide, and target that population first of those facilities first, and then go on to do the public schools after that. I mean, that's a that's a perfectly fair statement and a policy decision that would be made by the general assembly. But you would, I'm not arguing against it, but we do lose the economy of scale of, of doing it regionally. So. But yes, that, I mean, that certainly has, from a public health protection standpoint, that should sure make sense. So going back to the child care centers where you have data already, I guess. Over, you know, over the last three years, you've got everybody. And you've got that not just by pass fail, you've got it by a number. So we could say those that were over five are the ones that you're going to target first. And we don't have to go and do all the testing right away until their next licensing might be on that, the that's, the, that's another option. Yeah. So, I mean, the other, the other thing I would say is that what we know from the testing is there isn't a huge problem. <clears throat> yeah. But you'll know now, you'll know now from the testing that's been done what their levels were. Right. That's, yeah. So Grandma Kate's file, the child care center might be at three. And Cooper Lee's questionable child care center <laughs> could be at, could be at, well couldn't be at twenty three otherwise you'd lose your license would be one of the reasons fourteen years yeah. fourteen fourteen that could be at fourteen so you're gonna <laughs> so at, at my place you don't have to retest but at his place you need to start you need to look at that one and say we need to get the remediation down. I mean, we need, we need to remediate. Yes. So can I just be clear? Yeah. So we have that 
that specific data, not just that they passed, that they were less than 14, but how much, what, what their level was? Is that? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so, that, so that, that this is a very big and important point. We just said we're only doing one, we're only doing one tap. Yeah. At those child care. Because, child care. because, because that's, we have a grant, so the Department of Health has a grant, so we yeah. pay for the testing. Yeah. For child care centers. So that, that's a good, that's a good and point. One, and one liter sample Different volume. Sample size. And the sample size that's being proposed is at 250 milliliters, so different volume. Okay, so this is new money that you have available to you? So it's money that we've, we've been using for child care centers. Right. So you've been using money for child care centers. You only have to go in and test one tap per place. <coughs> well, we have, we have the money to test. The, the test for one place, and that's what they've been, and that's one fixture, and that's what they've been doing. Okay, that's federal money. Yes. And you would be using that money to test all these child care centers again? I'm having trouble yeah. with having to test again. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having trouble with having to test again. I realize that you didn't test all the tests. I mean, you didn't test, test all of those things. Find a way for I do want to clarify, just uh, yeah. maybe this is not a particularly helpful point, but I'll make yeah. it briefly. Yeah. And that is that they're not complying with Department of Health or, or regulations. Right. Licensees are complying with DCF regulations, which require compliance with the, with the, with the water supply rule. Right. Just so you know where sort of we fit in. Right. We're simply finding the money and doing the testing. Right. We're not. We, we don't have a regulatory relationship with, with those licensees. Kind of unusual sort of culminating. No, no, gosh, I you know some of I this is this is so challenging just in terms of the goal and how you get there. Right now, you know, and it's like you're saying, I've made a pledge to always ask, well, who's going to do all this work and how's it actually going to happen on the ground and what's it going to cost? And we're all over the place. I'm going to. Uh, Jeff Francis wanted to add some. Well, I'll, but I'll defer to the committee members. I was trying okay. to wait till the end. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, was Representative Batchelor? Too? It was, but I've forgotten it. Oh. <laughs> I'll, think, I'll think of it. <laughs> Senior moment. Goes with the gray okay. hair. <laughs> so I, I, Jeff Francis from the Superintendent's Association. Yeah. Um, I was not clear about the adoption of regional schedules either because the language in the bill is May. So it says the department may adopt the schedule. Mm -hmm. And now I'm confused about the testing program overall. So is the intent that you will go site to site and train people or, ha or have people come to a training in advance of the way the schedule lays out? The answer is probably both. Mm -hmm. That we will, we will hold trainings and then if need be, we will go and we will train people. Okay. Um, so I, so, a, I'm really appreciative of the, the level of detail that you're delving into because I think good implementation is going to require that. The, the program becomes logistically more complicated if you've got facilities that are going to participate in training, uh, or participate in sampling on somebody else's schedule, like, except why you would want to do it and that you have to do it, but also one of the interests that the facilities managers didn't speak much about today was just the ability to get the sampling done, particularly if the number of outlets that are going to be tested. So I, so I, I think that this is doable. Absolutely, I'm not objecting to that. I'm just, I'm, I'm rolling over my head every logistical detail that's going to have to be contended with. And it's one thing to gather 40 folks in a lab at the at the Department of Health. It's another thing entirely to be dealing with personnel from 40, 50, 60 schools that are spread out across the region. So I'm going to be interested before this is concluded in terms of how you define a region, when you'll test personnel, what the or it's when you'll train personnel, what the nature of the training is what the dissemination of the sample bottles is, the collection method, and so on and so forth. Because I, you know, without discouraging folks, there's going to be a dollar cost, direct or indirect, as associated with every one of those actions. So, Madam Chair, right? so we did all that in the, in the pilot. Right. We do have the experience of doing it. Right. And again, these are, these are human beings. It's not that, like, if, if this turns out, we get in and this becomes impossible, we come back to you and say, 
boy, this is actually a much bigger job. It's going to take a little bit. We're still on the job. We're still doing it night and day. Probably going to need a little more time. And your pilot will go through all in urban. Yes. Your pilots, yeah. Um, wait, I did yeah. remember. Is that another bachelor? Well, my major thing to me was until we test, we won't know what we need. So, therefore, we don't need to know how much money it's going to cost to remediate this. So, why not just get the testing done and see what's happening? That makes the most sense. Get it done, get the testing done, get the results, and then try to figure out where we're going to get all the money we're going to need. Well, at least we'll know how much, <coughs> approximately. I think the question becomes what happens when we get. I know. We get all the tests. Well, down. I'm sure we have money right so now. Jane, I, we'll summarize later, right? Yeah, and okay. yeah, we're, so we're going to stay focused on talking here. Yeah. I don't mean to be facetious, but couldn't you make a YouTube video on how to do the testing? I mean, wouldn't you have as much accuracy as and then people could just sign off that they watch it, or the district could watch it, or the school could watch it at the same time? I think we time? actually have done that. The video. So that, that's getting a little bit too deeply into their work. We're going to trust that these I'm people I'm just thinking of, it. right, but I'm yeah. just thinking about the implementation of this. If that, Seems like that would save a lot of time. It's, it's, and so we, we've done those those kinds of things. We've, we've made the video. The truth matters that a lot of these things do become manual because people have questions, uh, and that's something that we, that at least, working in, in doing this work for about a decade, sometimes I don't think about it as oh we're doing we're doing something we, we're going to establish op, you know opioid the, the, the rules for prescribing the opioids for pain. Well, I had I just filled a lot of questions from doctors. I didn't think about how much of my time was going to be talking <coughs> to to physicians. Yeah. Um, so all of these things, they do have this sort of ancillary, you know, resource cost. Even if, if you do everything you still can, there's still going to be some level of resources you need to do it. Um, can you remind me how long the pilot project took to do? I think it's in your yeah, November to June. Yeah. That's about six months. Six months. Is that a Sorry that you're dropping in in the middle of this. No, no, um, the, the lab, so I heard you say you need to set up a lab and staff it. So, it, no, we have a lab. No. Okay. So, no, what we have, so I, I explained the, the committee. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. at another committee. Um, <laughs> what we have is we, what we call the health operations center, so which is, which is an incident command center. So all the folks who are involved, who are touched by this work, come and meet and talk about Logistics, finance, law, um, what, whatever might be needed. So that's a that's something that is put up in the in the cases of the foodborne illness. There's an outbreak of measles, and so we decided because this is such an enormous job that we would implement that as a tool. We would use this tool as an as a way to implement the what we see coming. And the staffing of that center, yes, uh, operation center, is done with folks from DOH that. Are yes. there now? Yes. So, um, I, I guess I'm just trying to drive it. Is is there? A, does this represent a, a definable cost? Because you're not doing other work, you're going to have to. Yes. Are there, so, are there so, considerations? So, so, yes, absolutely. So people are doing this work. People are doing this work and not other work, right. and they're coding to, and they're going to be coding to this work, and 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 therefore be, be charging for it. So we will need we will need money to pay staff for that for the work that they're currently doing and will be doing. And is that uh, a, num a known number right now? So, well, we, so I mean, the, the, the fiscal note takes into account that work, yes. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that, so I'll look at that. that to you. Okay. So, um, what I think I'm hearing, though, from folks is that the sooner we can get started with this, the better that's going to be. And there's going to be a place where we are just going to have to make a decision. And we are going to ha we're just going to have to make a decision. And it, then it's going to go to appropriations, and they're going to have to make a decision about where that is. So I, I know that there's still a lot of little questions that we have, and some of those I'm asking these folks to help us figure out how we might be able to make sure some of those are being addressed, but we're putting it in their hands, either through rule or a report back. And you were working on something, I think, is that correct? Yes. Something to help us with that. I want to, it would be my goal that we get something out of this committee this week. 
okay, this week. Um, and I, you will be around, you'll, you'll be around again, because this is a, a, an important one for you. I, I, I brought a mattress, so I'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should get a better idea on the fiscal note, so we're, we're going to have a, those folks are going to get back to us on, on the cost, um, giving us a better idea of the cost, which leaves us, we need to work on the timeline, the action level, and who is going to be included. In the meantime, we're going to be hearing from the, um, from uh, Reva Murphy tomorrow, who, who's uh, Department of Children and Families, if you have information for us to show us, we are looking to see if perhaps we can handle the child care facilities in this committee so we can move it faster. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to send it upstairs and have them go through the grueling process that we're going through. If um, we could get an idea, if, if you have the list of child care centers and can show us where they are, we don't need the names of them. If you need to redact that, that's fine. But how many right now, uh, on the levels that you have now, are above 15, you know, above 10, above 5, 1, to, I think, to get I think that? Actually, I think we provided those. Yeah. For, for child care? We got it for, for child, child care? care? Yes. Is this the one that was the Excel sheet that um, <clears throat> got mixed up in our PDF? Yeah. You have the whole Excel workbook, and then you have the single page. Yes. Okay. I think I said that's one. I think I said I think I said the PDF. Yeah. Okay. The PDF. Yes. Yeah. It was it was an Excel sheet. Um, um, came, so go ahead. Uh, one thing when we're trying to get an accurate fiscal note, which is really proving a challenge, is the original one we had talked about a year. So we have uh, employees at the um, Department of Health. 125,000. That's for a year. Yes. Okay. So, and now you're talking year and a half, which I still think is ambitious. Uh, We're ambitious in the department. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, say optimistic. Well, oh, that's nice that you're optimistic too. <laughs> I had some other really great thought, but uh, I, I have to run to schools. There are a lot of thoughts that are called. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, yes. The child care centers, uh, you keep talking, we, our license, I want a clarification if a licensed child care center is under the same regulation as a registered child care center, or is that old language and doesn't exist anymore? So there are, there are two different, so there's like home base and there are child care centers. Those are two different regulations. Yes. Both under DCF. So, so Reba, you can spring it on Reba. Yeah. Start with Liz, she loves that. I have, I have the list that has schools. But, uh, so, this is, right. so this is a, but not am I lying to you, Shannon? So you have the, the one PDF is an Excel workbook that doesn't work as PDF, but the other one pager is, is that what you're referring to? I, I, don't, I, thought, I thought I sent you a, a PDF of the, of the results from the child care. Okay. Yes, I can pull it up and double check if this is the right one. Okay. Does that work for you? Sure. Um, Are we not going to show the committee? It's just like we're hiding. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Go for it. It's we're behind you, so there's no hiding here. Oh. Yeah. 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 That's the schools. That's the schools. Oh, maybe I got to do it. Is this the original? This is the PDF that doesn't work, but it's from the workbook that does. That's the PDF. This one is really hard to yes. figure out what it's telling us. That's and it's cool. 132 That's pages long. Yeah. yeah. And not sortable. That's because the we can't upload other than PDF, and the PDF doesn't see Excel. Where's the data in this, though? Can we just get a little diagnosis? Um, <laughs> what if I was want to it? Is there something else? Well, it just looks like a list of schools. I just can't tell what's in it. I've been looking at it for a while. I'll resend the Excel version to everyone again. Here's this. Oh, you've got it? Is there still something else that we're just not? What happened? Do you, do you use this kind? There was under anything. If I can find it. Yeah. Here we go. Mm -hmm. no. 
to come from hell. I think for sure. Rita's testimony in the Senate has some numbers in it that she was stating on I'm sorry, this is the one. This is the one that I have. That you said. This is the one that has been doing. Yeah. It's still different than this. Um. Let's get out of here. You just want to spend willy-nilly without doing research. It's difficult. Everybody's doing the research. We're just not hearing. Research is that these guys got all this stuff. It's going to take a long time, but it's going to be worth it. Well, do you have a testimony? I mean, theoretically, I can do it. I mean, could be twenty million dollars. I have a phone to pay. I mean, so let's just put it down. I'm going to ask. So I'm I'm going to go. I'm going to go to witness. Yeah. You like that idea? Yeah. And then I'm going to try and find it. What if they have a high level? Then another. But it's out there. Well, we'll have to show. We can. can Here we have seven kids too. There you go. And there's only a few of us. The results are the same. The results can be the same. Is that what you're saying? What do you think? Because you guys have parents. Is that correct? Is that correct? The person in the parent. We tried to look at that. I don't know. Information public. Yeah. And the public is up in our phone. We've got a little bit of lead in our water. <laughs> 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 there we are. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank All right, you. there we <laughs> go. <laughs> you can erase that other thing there. Fast, fast, fast. Okay, so don't erase the red. Don't erase the red. Erase the red. You can erase the red. Okay. I can remember it. We don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> We're going to get those answers. The questions answered. Hope, hope. So you're talking about a fairly small universe. We have a fairly small universe. I'm saying if the number was, it was five PPB, yeah. it's, it's, only, it's affecting a small number of others. Mm. Well, it's, it's, 14 plus 22 plus 73, correct? Oh, greater than, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. It's 14, so it's, it's 19. And, and if it's a home base, you're probably talking about a tap. Yeah, but you're going to a tap. Yeah. And what about the child care, what about the child care centers? I'm actually not. I'm the question. That's the home. Registered. Yeah, I, I might have to ask her for that. Okay, for that's Coop's home, Coop's yeah. child care, and my child care. I'd have, I'd have to ask. I can ask her. Okay. She she is, uh, is she on the schedule for tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Okay. Time. So, yeah. Well, do you, would you mind checking with her, her David, to yes. get us that information? Yes. Thank you. Beth, yeah. Beth Devani for the Mosaic Learning Center. Uh, this is actually a question for the committee. I mean, we know that depending upon where you draw lines depends upon what where the costs may be. Um, but then there are unanticipated costs that Mike Hiroshi sort of touched upon. When you ever <coughs> engage in tinkering with buildings, sometimes though you may think it starts out as being simple, it becomes more complicated, and you're often required to bring things up to code that have nothing to do with why you were originally back there behind the wall. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is, if this committee is committed to whatever language it has, based upon the idea that there will be appropriate funding to schools to make the remediation, that, what happens when the Appropriations Committee comes to a different conclusion and funds only a part of this, but not all of this? Where does that leave those of us? That is the question for another day. OK. <laughs> I just I want to just make sure 
the, the questions that are before uh, you folks now, we obviously will be having more discussion tomorrow, given we've just gotten a lot of information. Yeah, I, I see. There's something else within the committee to our witnesses. Elena, is it something for the witnesses? Oh, no, go ahead. If it's, it's something for the case. committee. It's something for the committee. Okay. Kathleen? Yeah, I do have a question. It, it's more of a background question. Um, I'm just looking at the, the Digger article that came out when the pilot was released. And it looked like at that time when the pilot was released that none of the agencies were recommending mandated lead testing in schools. I, I, I don't <laughs> in particular recall of the article. Certainly we, we had to gather around and, and talk with, with the, the, the governor's office as well as everybody else who was involved before we could make the recommendation yep. as and we tried to think about the universe. I mean, I realize we're yeah. not there anymore, yes. but I'm, I'm just trying to get a handle on how we got how we got here. So it, as a result of the pilot, there yes. was not a recommendation. Well, I would, say we, there, I would say there is a recommendation that came in the form of the, of the governor's support and, and, and his announcement in his inaugural speech. Which was for mandated testing in every school. I yes. can't remember. I'm yes. sorry. I can't remember. Yes, it was. Yes. Okay, so it shifted somewhere along the way. Well, it was we had this in, we had this information, and we need to now think about what the information is and what it was the you know and how do we do this? So it took it did take some months to put everybody's heads together, okay. um, and then come come forward. And the original one left everything at 15 as an action level. So that was the that was the test. That's where the donors position. No, with no remediation. There. What? With no remediation. With no remediation. In, in that current. In that way. Are we um, sufficiently full of information? <laughs> Do you think, committee, that we can begin to start to close in on some of the questions that we have before us in terms of our what we need to do to get this bill out of here? Okay. Well written. Yes. Want you to think about that. Um, we will come back tomorrow. I think we've got a pretty heavy floor again. Is that right? Okay. But we will be here in the morning, which will make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yes, Shannon. Also, <laughs> um, I have two announcements for the committee. One is that Dylan, Representative Jim, he still left you all a pamphlet that he asked me to hand out on behalf to you. So please get one of these before you leave. Um, it's Vermont Educational Opportunities Programs. The other thing is that with Jeff Francis here, we, the entire committee, has been invited to a um, lunch meet and greet and just general discussion with the VSA. They're having a meeting on March 28th, which is next Thursday, from 11 to 1. So the first part would be 11 to 12. Correct me if this is different now. And um, lunch 12 to 1. Your floor starts at 1 that day, so it's before the budget conversation that will be happening. So we can get you back here in time. Jeff, do you want to add anything in? No, thank you. Where is it? Oh, and it's at the Capitol Plaza Hotel. Thank so you. we're all just going to take a field trip and walk over. I'll go with you. And um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Chaperone, yes, are you? I certainly. <laughs> you, you do not think that you'll be able to make this for, for the lunch. Please, please let um, Shannon know because they will be. We need a headcount on Friday. Yeah. Friday. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.